think we're there. Yep. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's so good to be here. I am an old friend of Ray's. Uh, when I say old, I don't mean I'm old in age. <laughs> I meant that I'm an old friend of Ray's for over 30 years. Ray and I have broke bread together so many times. We've laughed just uncontrollably so many times. We talked about the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and end times and so that's what Ray and me and Ray. That's what my past it was Ray. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And uh, so I was uh, honored when Buffy, who was a phenomenal artist, I had her artwork at my house. I was honored when Buffy asked me to do Sabbath school. Um, has anybody heard about me? I'm Curtis Hall. Has anybody heard my name before? I thought I was famous all over the world. <laughs> I guess somebody had heard about me. All right, great, great, great. Well, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I actually have a Sabbath school training ministry. That's what I do. I travel around the church and the conferences and have a Sabbath school, and I have an online Sabbath school called Hit the Mark. It's on YouTube and Facebook. We have about a thousand people that watch us every week for Sabbath school. So the pandemic has wrecked havoc on our churches, but it's also opened up opportunities for us to witness that we would not have done otherwise. So here, I'm here today to do Sabbath school. And we have a great lesson discussion today. Uh, we are in the eighth lesson of the quarter. And of course, someone will go around with microphones as you need them. Uh, the only thing I will suggest strongly is that you feel free to say anything you want to say as long as it is short and on the top. Okay, so whatever comes to your mind, just, just feel free to say it as long. <laughs> As you keep it short and on time, because we're going to run out of time. I'll never give you everything I want to talk about today. Uh, we are, we, like this quarter, we're doing the book of Deuteronomy. We're jumping from place to place. Um, and now we're almost to the end of the chapter using a particular verse. We are in chapter 30. So we're going to read together Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. How do I say we're going to read it? Yeah. We're going to read it together. So don't leave me hanging. I'll give you a second to find it. Chapter 30, verse 19. Chapter 30, verse 19. All right? All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's read together. I call heaven to record this day. Oh, let's start all over. That's, that's not too good. We're going to do it again. I, I, need, I need a few more people just to give me a little encouragement. Verse 19. I'm in the King James Version. Read whatever version you want. It doesn't matter. It'll blend in. Verse 19. Verse, we're in chapter 30. Verse 19. Chapter 30. Verse 19. Okay? Here we go. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That will be right, right, right. So we're going to, we're going to look at this lesson from one particular angle. There's a many we can use, but we're going to use one particular angle. We are going to consider the motives of what we read today. So to make sure we're all on the same page, when I say the word motive, when I say the word motive, what comes to your mind? Agenda. Agenda? Do I hurt that? Goal. A goal? Okay, that was good. A plan? Purpose. Keep going? Purpose. Purpose. Driving force. Driving force. I love that. The why behind. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love the why behind. Anybody else? Motive. Courtroom. Courtroom. <laughs> okay. I, okay, what was that? How do you going? Okay, I love that. I love that. Anybody else? The depths of the heart. The depths of the heart. Okay. So, perseverance. What she has suggested, and let me know if I'm right on this, that motive is, 
would be classified under an emotion, like in the heart. Yeah, would, would you agree with that? Is, does anybody disagree with that? Is that okay? Okay. So we're going to look at motive, but I'm going to split hairs before we get started. There's motive, and then there is incentive. Does anybody see a difference between those two words? Motive and incentive. Somebody help me. What does incentive mean? I heard all those good definitions about motive. What about incentive? The, I heard, I heard something. What was that? Your reward? No, I was going to say reward after the, uh, after the uh, purpose has been achieved. Okay, okay, I like that. Yes, were you saying something, sir? All right, yes, yes. Did I see somebody else? Incentive, anybody else? Or did we cover it all? Motive with reward. The, the motive of the reward? With reward. Motive with reward, okay. I think the incentive is something that's given to you from somebody else to get you to do it. Okay, like the like the you know proverbial carrot before you know an enticement. I, I like that. I don't like that. It, it almost like gives some 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 flesh to the reasons of why. Okay, the, you, you might be motivated, but there's some incentive to motivation. We're going to see how this plays into what we're reading today because uh, it's fascinating. Okay, so the Bible. This this week's lesson is choose life. And the Bible is a book, among other things, it's a book about choices. From beginning to end, the Bible is a book about choices. So we're just going to kind of narrowly focus on a few. And we're going to look at the first wrong choice in the Bible. Somebody tell me which was the first wrong choice. Okay, I heard it. Does anybody know where it's found at? Where the text is? Genesis. I heard something. Genesis chapter 3. All right, Genesis 3. Maybe for the sake of time, we'll just read. I need a volunteer. I know there's a mic back there, but anybody who can, if you can read Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. And again, we are filtering this through motives. And incentives, okay? That's what we're going to kind of see if we can just hammer in. Anybody want to volunteer to read uh, chapter 3, verse, yes, ma'am, right here? This kind of lady right behind you, sir. She's going to read. Okay? Uh, so we're in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the servant said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay. I right, know we're going to have to put on our spiritual thinking caps right now. Um, well, I really dated myself with thinking caps. <laughs> That's an old saying there. I haven't heard that in the eons. Okay, so here's what I want us to help to decipher. What was the formula that the enemy used to cause her to make this wrong choice? What was the formula that Satan used in these verses we just read that helped her to make a wrong choice. Anybody see anything that he did? Yes, ma'am. What, what was the incentive then? She will be like God. Okay, she would be like God. Okay, I love that. Yes, ma'am, please. Well, he also put out uh, partial truths. Partial truths. She, she could agree with part of it, but yeah. she had, couldn't agree with all of it, but it was agreeable. It, it was something there that was partially true. Yes, sir, please. Deception. Deception. Okay, yes, 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 please. The eyes open and, be, and become wise. Eyes open and become wise. Curiosity. Yes, curiosity. Buffy, yes. It made her feel that she was not enough. Oh, well, I like she that. needed to be more. She needed to be more, because that's what he was offering her. Uh, yes, sir. Just follow to that. Doubt. Doubt. Doubt about what? No, I got it. Okay, so, so, so we're going to kind of focus this in. The formula he was using was one thing was to doubt what God said. 
Not only yes, this will make you nice, this will make you that, but it, it was an insinuation that God is not quite right about this thing. Everybody agree so far? Okay. Um, which, which distrusting God is something that the devil still uses for us today. All of us in our minds right now can think about times that God has clearly impressed us to do something and we doubt what God on it. Like, I'm not so sure or I don't know if I can do that or I, there must be an easier way. Yes, sir, please. I think that he, he didn't use um, the thing that God wasn't right, but he used the same the same problem that he had, that he felt as God was holding something back for him, yeah. that he was good enough, that he couldn't come in. Yeah. And Absolutely. he used that same thing to fool her. Absolutely. Uh, he, he, was, he was almost questioning God's wisdom. Like, that's what he was doing, was questioning God's wisdom. Like, why would God keep you from this? He, he knows. He knows this is going to help. Yes, ma'am, I saw your hand. Yes. Well, he must have knew, known that he had hooked her with that because he he openly contradicted God in the next in the next sentence. I mean, that quick, he yeah. got to open contradiction. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's just so remarkable when we think about what led her to a wrong choice, how it's repeated in my life mm. and in maybe some of you guys' lives. Over and over the same strategy. Amen. Same strategy. Okay, so here's what, here's what, here's what I, I want to prove that. I want to prove that. Uh, can anyone think of a Bible example of another time where someone or some people distrusted what God said and it had bad results? I'll give you a second. I know you didn't have a chance to think about that. Yes. Chorus Rebellion. Chorus Rebellion. What was that about? Well, they thought they were holy enough. They could come in. Same, same problem. Okay. All right. All right. I like that. Anybody else got something come to your mind? Yes, Buffy? Kadesh Barnea. What is that about? Well, they were right at the border of the Holy Land, and they didn't think they could take it. So they sent in some spies that the Lord never asked them to do. And the people believe the bad reports. Let's go. Let's find that. Anybody know where that story Buffy's talking about? Anybody know what book of the Bible it's in? Exodus. Exodus? It's in one of those old books, but I don't know if the story's in Exodus. Uh, come on. Let's just kind of keep going. Exodus. Numbers. <laughs> you were close. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. And let's see here. Numbers chapter 13. Buffy, that's the exact story. Let's see if it's here. Let's see if it's here. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the background, just like Buffy said, they were there. They were ready to go. They had this plan. Okay, let's check it out. And I need someone to read verse 30 and 31 of Numbers 13. Who will be my reader for me? Verse 30 and 31. All right, sir, please, as loud as you can. Go here. Oh, there's a mic. Great, great, great. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. <coughs> but the men that went up with him said, We will we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. All right, thank you. What do we see in just these two verses? I know you know the rest of the story, and we'll get to some more of the story. What do you see that is happening in these two verses we just read? Doubt. Doubt in God. Doubt. Doubt. What else is happening? Doubt. What else is happening? Lack of faith. Lack of faith? Not Fear. Understanding. Fear. Oh, man, I love that. Anybody else? What else do we see in these Not two? Not depending on God. Not depending on God? What else? Yes, please. Looking at it through man's eyes. Looking at it through man's eyes. Oh, you're, you're, going, you're getting closer to where I'm trying to go. Anybody else? What do we see in these verses? Dependence on self. Dependence on self. Human planning. Human planning. Forgetfulness. And why do you say forgetfulness? Because they had forgotten how God had led in the past. 
All the things that got to go before they got here. Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. After miracle, after miracle. Suddenly forgot. Oh, man, I hate to hear this story because it reminds me of some time. Okay, so um, the result, let's read this verse first before I, before I ask you another question. I'm going to jump to chapter 14. And I want to look at the result of what happened. And we'll go back to the verses we, that the gentleman read here. Chapter 14 says, and I'm going to read these verses. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. So they're, they're just crying and weeping. Because God told them, listen, you don't, you're going too far. You're not going in. This is a real problem, okay? And all the children of Israel, here's a key word, murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt! Oh, would God we had died in this wilderness. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? After all they had just experienced. I just, before we move on, this is just a side note. But I think it's an important point. The evil a murmuring is displayed in these verses. Now we don't use that word murmuring right now. We use the word whispering, gossiping, whining, whining complaining, talking negative. And it has destroyed many a church because someone started murmuring against the pastor. Mm -hmm. well, maybe the pastor's not perfect. I, I don't know who in here is perfect. But instead of being a help, they murmur. Or against the elder. Or against the Sabbath school teacher. Or against these people. Or against those people. And the result is always the same. It's a catastrophe. So, in the story we just read, the gentleman read the verses in verse 13, there were two people talking, Caleb and Joshua, and the other people. And the force of the negative words derailed everyone. I'm sure there were people that would have gone along with Caleb and Joshua if the other ten spies had said, let's do it. Because they're just following the leaders. That's like a lot of us. We, that's not really our position, but we just get talked into stuff that we don't really believe. But it, it, it caused the entire nation to forfeit a blessing that was right there. It's an amazing story. I think sometimes when I visit different churches and we're talking about how we can do evangelism in the city, how we can make an impact with our church, we start to say, well, we don't have the right resources. We don't have the money. We don't have the right people. We need to get somebody in here to help us. Right on the precipice of victory, we forget all the miracles that God did for our churches. But then we look and say, those are giants out there. And, uh, that, well, there's no giants in New Smyrna Beach. All I see are happy people. I see folks surfing and wind sailing. Okay, in some of the places, there's some difficult people, but not here, I know. Okay, so that's an example of the influence of the negative. We're going to see how this plays in to what we're talking about. So let's kind of go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, which is where we were earlier. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's see here. And we're going to just analyze just a few verses before we get down to our memory verse. I need another volunteer to read for me. All I want you to read is verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 and 16. And when this person reads, we're looking for the motive and the incentive. That's what we're looking for. Who's my reader? Who do I have? Uh, Right here. Okay, great. So we're in chapter 30, verses 15 and 16. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to command and keep his commandments and his statutes 
and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whether thou goest to possess thee. Okay, so I'm going to ask an easy question first. Anybody see any motives or incentives in the verses we just read? Yeah, life. Yes. Life. Life. I mean, it's, it's some good stuff. And then we're going to see what that means in more detail. Uh, multiply, you know, which was huge for a nation. Uh, prosperity, what was that? Blessing. Blessing. First, it was, um, I said before, the promise. A promise. Oh, I like that. There's a promise. Now, here's my question, and we're gonna we're gonna flesh this out a little more. So I'm gonna try to stay on track. What if the first part of verse 16 was not there? The first. Let me see here. Let's see here. Is there a comma? Uh, before all the way, the first part of 16 to a comma. Do you think it would make any difference if that part was not in there? Why would it make a difference? He's still commanding you to obey. Why does why does the first part of verse 16, yes sir, please? Because it's the same problem as we've been talking about in the beginning. It's all we, we, we. We have this problem. We can't do this. The okay. giant's in the land. The okay. focus is gone. If the focus is God, the perspective is right. And you have the power to achieve whatever needs to be done. Because it's not you. It's not you. Right. Anybody else, sir? Yes, I don't know if there's a mic hand before you. Uh, I can be heard. You can be heard? Okay. What do, what, do, what do you think of that first part was not in there? Well, negative is a motivation if we try to learn kids, but it doesn't last. Yeah, good point. But good motivates. Good motivates. Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else say anything in here? Why am I asking you, what if we left that first part of verse 16 out? Yes, ma'am, please. Well, I think it just reinforces the verse 15. You know, God wants us to take God's word. And it's his word there saying, I'm telling you this. Okay. And all the way along, all the examples we've looked at are people who don't take God at his word. Okay. I like that. I like that. That's good. Yes, sir, please, right here. There's a mic coming right behind your shoulder. To me, the motive is right there is to love God. Yes. Okay. And that drives everything else. What if I'm obedient to God, but I don't love him? Isn't that okay? I mean, the whole, this, this whole thing we're talking about is choosing to obey. So what if I just follow what this gentleman said, and I just, I'm still obedient, but I don't really love God. You're not obedient. Oh, she says I'm not obedient. I'm going to see if she can prove that. Yes, sir, please. That's the first commandment. First commandment. The greatest commandment. All right, now this is it. This is probably going to be too easy when I'm about to ask. Yes, sir, please. Which comes first, faith or love? Which comes first, faith or love? He asked me a question. <laughs> <laughs> which comes first, faith or love? All right, somebody tell me, which comes first, faith or love? Love, love, love. is the Sometimes I don't know. Because I'm thinking as a parent. I'm thinking as a parent with grown children now. There were times that I wanted my children to obey because I knew it was in their best interest. They, they didn't necessarily obey because I love dad or whatever, but they knew this. I'm serious about this. So I don't know. So, I don't know. God takes us where we are. That I must, but I, I guarantee where he's trying to get us is that we love him. Amen. All right? Yes, sir, please. Yeah. If, you, if you obey without love, it's legalism. It's yes. Anybody agree with that? Yes. I, would, I would even go so far to say it's hypocrisy. Woo. All right, so let's see if I can prove that. I have to prove that's a strong. Can anyone, this is an easy question, think of a Bible story, I'm going to give you some clues, some breadcrumbs, in the New Testament that involved Jesus that illustrates this very point we're talking about? Can anybody think of a story where someone, I'm going to give you some more clues, where someone was obedient, but they were missing something? Yeah, the rich, young ruler. the rich young ruler. Let's turn to Mark. We're going to, it's in three Gospels, I believe, but we're going to read it from. Uh, let's read it from the book of Mark. Uh, Mark chapter. I'm pretty sure it's Mark. 
Do I know what chapter it is in Mark? I think it's Mark chapter 10. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Great, great, great. I have it. Okay, I need another volunteer to help me read some verses. you got a lot to read this time. Um, I'll probably interrupt you, whoever it is, to have thick skin, because I want to interrupt you, because the stories won't get good to me. Who's my reader? Where are you? Where is it? I'm in Mark chapter 10, and we're going to, we're going to start reading uh, at verse 17, and you're going to read all the way to verse 22. Who's my... All right, sir, right here, do you have a mic? Somebody, okay, but there's two mics coming at you, okay? Somebody hold it for them. All right, we're in Mark chapter 10, starting at verse uh, 17. Go ahead and answer, please. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. All right, I'm going to stop you right there, and then I'll have you continue reading in a second. Here's a person who comes up to Jesus earnestly, sincerely, and, and what is implied in the story is that although he was everything we want our children to be, well, like, if, like if I knew that person, I would say, man, I wish my daughter could marry him. And that's the kind of person I'd be like, man, I love to have him in my family. He's, he's, he's honorable, he's respectful, he's <laughs> diligent, he's got finances, he's obedient, he's a churchgoer. But yet, it, what is implied in the story, he knew something was missing. Or he wouldn't even have talked to Jesus. He knew something is missing from my experience. So he goes to Jesus and asks him, well, what do I need to do? There's something missing. Okay, sir, keep reading for me, please. Pick up the story. What verse are you in now? 21. 21. All right, pick up the story, please. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Oh, stop. I'm sorry. I told you I was going to interrupt you. All right. I told you. Now, now, that, that sentence in there is powerful. Why is that sentence in there? Because he loved Adam. He loved them all. He's looking at him with love. You know, God, he, he's, he's not trying to, to make his life hard. Or make his life morbid or depressing. He's looking at him and he's saying, I love this guy. If I can reach this guy with what I'm about to say, his life is going to change. I, I love him. I, I'm just looking in his eyes and there's something special about this young man. Jesus said, and the Bible says he loved him. And I imagine, as the gentleman keeps reading, his words were spoken in, 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 in tones of love and compassion and concern. That's just my guess. That as he's talking to this young man, this is not just a, a legalistic conversation. This is a conversation of love happening. All right, sir, please keep reading. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. And said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. But he was sad at this word, and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around. That's and said, fine. You're fine. You're fine right there. Before we, before we keep reading, I just want to digest what we just read here. What you just read, Jesus says, Listen, I'm going to make 